Geology and Geophysics and Petroleum Engineering in the Departments of Geology and Geophysics and Chemical and Petroleum Engineering. He received his PhD in Geophysics from Stanford University. Um, Dr. Grana's background includes mathematics and statistics with multiple, multiple MS degrees in this area. His research interests include rock physics, seismic reservoir characterization, geostatistics, time-lapse reservoir modeling, and inverse problems. Um, in 2014, uh, Dr. Grana received the coveted International Innie Award that recognizes ex outstanding research and development in the fields of energy and environment. Um, he and his research team um, were awarded this for their innovative method in obtaining information about oil and gas reservoirs using seismic techniques. In 2014, he uh, co-authored a, a rock physics textbook released internationally by Cambridge Press, and he's the author of multiple publications. So we're honored to have you. Thank you. Okay, so um, so today I'm going to talk about a research topic that is not my main research topic, but I thought it was um, the most relevant for um, the mission of SER, um, which is an interdisciplinary uh, major and uh, an institution by, by definition. So today I'm going to talk about the use of geostatistics, which is what I generally do, in this a decision making process, which is something that I never do. Um, my idea is that I do mathematical modeling and then I give my models to uh, people in oil companies and they make decisions. Um, then if their decisions are bad, well, it's not my fault by definition. <laughs> um, but before talking about that, so the reason why I, I'm, um, I have this talk is that a couple of, um, well, last year I was asked to give a um, a lecture in Dubai about uncertainty quantification and management. Now, I know a little bit about uncertainty quantification. This is what I generally do, but I had no idea what uncertainty in management was. So I had to learn uh, basically something new, and it was kind of interesting, actually. Um, so in this talk, there, there's going to be three parts, essentially. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about um, the research that I generally do, which is reservoir modeling based on geostatistics. And then I will briefly introduce what decision-making means, and especially I'm going to present um, the tool that we generally use in decision-making, which is um, decision trees, and I'm going to tell you what a decision tree is. And then I'm going to try to combine um, geostatistics with uh, decision trees and see how we can apply this kind of workflow um, in an oil company. Um, so this is, these are examples of reservoir models, and most of you are familiar uh, with, with these kind of models, but there are also some undergraduate students, which is always good. So I'm just going to uh, briefly introduce what a reservoir model is. Well, first of all, there's a structure, a component, which means essentially that um, we try to mimic the geometry uh, in the subsurface. For example, if you look at this example on the left, uh, there are some faults, and the geometry is not trivial at all. So. Um, if you think that the reservoir is a cube, well, forget about this idea for, for a second. We will go back to the reservoir as a cube in five minutes. Um, I like making a lot of simplifications in, 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 my, in my science. Um, then once we have a geometry, we try to discretize uh, this kind of complicated geometry. So it's not really clear from this picture, but um, if, you, if you carefully look at that, there are a lot of um, grid cells, and my, my goal is basically to, to put some properties uh, in these grid cells. Um, the properties could be porosity, saturation, or the properties that we're interested in in the reservoir. Um, generally, properties that we can quantify. So there are some geologists here. Um, there are some properties that geologists don't quantify. Well, that's, that's the hard part. Um, Generally, we use some data to constrain our models. Typically, we use well logs, but obviously well logs do not give an exhaustive um, um, image of the reservoir. So what, what we generally use is geophysical data. Now, the issue with geophysical data is related to the resolution, because we actually measure the data on the surface for you know, reservoirs that could be 2,000 meters uh, in depth. Um, but the final goal is to make predictions. So we don't create models because we, well, I create models because I like making a lot of nice figures, but from an oil company perspective, they care about my uh, predictions as well. So here there are three different reservoir models at three different stages of uh, the modeling workflow. Like here, I assume essentially that the reservoir is a cube. This is more or less how you acquire uh, geophysical data according to some regular grids. 
and then you can put some geometry, you can put all the properties that you want. Um, I think that this is a, well, clearly this is a fake reservoir model. This is a true reservoir model in Norway. Um, essentially, you're looking um, at the reservoir from the top, so this is the, ga the, the color bar represents the oil saturation, so this is the gas cap at the top. There's no oil, there's only gas. This is the oil uh, basically below the gas. Remember that you're looking at that from the top. And then here, there's the water. Um, and I'm not really sure where this reservoir comes from because I stole the picture from, from Google Images yesterday because I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> um, there are actually two main uh, steps in reservoir modeling. One is the static reservoir modeling. and the second one is the dynamic reservoir modeling. What I generally focus on is the static part. My goal is to give a, an image of the reservoir before production starts. So there's nothing happening dynamically. We're not injecting fluid, we're, the, the pressure is constant, and so on and so forth. Um, so like here you have 300 wells or something like that. I think it is from Saudi Arabia. Um, some of them could be injectors, some of them could be producers, but if before production, we don't really care about that part, my goal before production is just to create an image of the reservoir to, meet, to, to, represent, to show um, how the, the, the reservoir model looks like. And these are the five main properties that um, I try to model. The, the main one is porosity, fluid saturation, permeability is actually hard to estimate from seismic data, but we can somehow reconstruct permeability using some correlations uh, with porosity. Lithology is the tricky one because for geologists, lithology can be phases, can be something that is not, that cannot be really quantified. It can be discrete or continuous, but the idea is that if you have a classic reservoir, conventional reservoir, um, sand is what you want to find, shale is something that you want to avoid. Um, so somehow this property contains that kind of information. Um, and there's also fluid pressure that from a static point of view, this is not really a big deal. Um, because we can assume that it is constant, it's not changing in time, and so on and so forth, unless you start producing clearly. Um, well, the, the goal of my research in the last seven years um, has been to try to develop mathematical methodologies to improve the reservoir description. Um, the main issue is related to the fact that far away from the well, we do not have direct measurements of the properties that we're interested in. You cannot measure porosity far away from the well. Actually, you cannot even measure porosity in the well. You can measure something which is close to porosity, but uh, I'm not gonna talk about the details of that. If you want to learn about that, I'm teaching well logging this semester. So. <laughs> um, so far away from the well, we do not measure the properties directly. What we can measure is something which depends on the properties that we care about. So mathematically, what we do is we solve an inverse problem. We know that seismic velocities depends on porosity. We can measure seismic velocities, and then now we want to go back. We want to get the, the, the porosity that gives you that specific seismic velocity in your field. Um, as I said before, the main issue is the low resolution. Um, I'm not sure if you have ever seen a seismic data set. This is not cool at all because they generally show that in uh, in a grayscale, I don't know why they don't use colors, but um, uh, the, the idea is that it, it's really hard to see something which is below the resolution of 10 meters, for example. So if you have, for example, a gas layer which is only two meters, it's really hard to see that from, from seismic data. Um, this low resolution and the, the noise that you have in seismic data sets and so on, the uncertainty that you have in, in your models uh, generates a lot of uncertainty in your static model that you create. So the idea is that, uh, so how do you represent that uncertainty? Well, as a statistician, what I would say is you use probability distributions. The problem is that if I try to give Vladimir, who is a reservoir engineer, um, a 3D model with a probability distribu distribution in each cell, he's probably going to punch me in the face because he, does, he wants a number, right? So. Um, in order to uh, basically show that, that kind of uncertainty, what we can do instead of uh, building a probabilistic model, we can basically build 100 deterministic models, and the uncertainty of the 100 models should represent the true uncertainty, um, or at least the uncertainty that we estimated in, in our static model. So this is what geostatistics is about, essentially. We create a lot of realizations. They all somehow um, match the seismic data set, um, they all match the well log data set, but they're all different because there's some uncertainty that we cannot solve using seismic data. 
So here there's an example. Um, if you use, for example, um, if, you, if you look at these two models of porosity, this is realization number one, this is realization number two. Now, I'm not sure if it is easy to see, but the porosity in this realization is for sure higher than the porosity in this realization. And the reason is that um, we do not have any information about the prior, uh, uh, sorry, any prior information about the porosity. So in, in our initial assumptions, we have to, to basically um, define the range for the porosity variations. In this case, it is actually shifted towards high values. In this case, it is shifted towards low values. Okay, now we're, done with, we're essentially done with the static reservoir model. It doesn't mean that it is good, but this is generally the best that we can do. So now we give the model to reservoir engineers, um, and what they do is they run fluid flow simulation. The idea is that you have an initial model of porosity and permeability, and then you try to mimic, for example, depletion or the, injector, the injection of uh, water and production of hydrocarbon. Um, and this is going to be essentially a dynamic simulation, so you're going to make predictions how much oil you're gonna, or gas you're going to produce in the next 10 years, 20 years, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the new part of my research, the one that I started, not the one related to decision making, but the one that I started two years, one, well, essentially last year, um, is related to um, finding a way to improve our initial model. So what happens very often is that I start with my static model, the one of, um, that I built before. I can start with 100 of them if I have them. And then I try to make predictions. And here there are some examples of oil production, water, cut and so on and so forth. Um, and what you see is generally in the predictions you have a lot of uncertainty, right? Um, if, if you go back to, my, to, to this model here, say that we compute permeability deterministically from porosity, well obviously this model is going to produce much more hydrocarbon than this model here. So the idea is that how can we narrow down this uncertainty? Um, using seismic data only, there's no way to do it because of the low resolution, the noise, and so on and so forth. But what we can do is, after we start producing, we can say that, for example, we start, well, here the timeline is relative one, uh, but say that this is 2015, right? And then now um, we start producing. Next year, we go to the field, and we can actually see the, the real production of, of, our, of our reservoir, right? Say that, for example, our estimations underestimate, well, they generally overestimate the hydrocarbon production um, so what we can do is to use the actual measurements in terms of production, try to go back, update our model, and essentially modify our model such that we can get better predictions for 2016. Now, in 2017, we can do the same. Now we have data set for 2016 and 2017. So theoretically, at least, our estimation should improve every year. You can even do that every 30 days if you have production data every 30 days. Right? Well, this is a domain that it is called history matching. Uh, it, history matching is nothing more than a data simulation problem. The idea is that uh, at different time steps you have different data that you can measure. So what you can do is essentially assimilate every time step new data in order to improve your prediction. It's called the history matching because essentially you're trying to match the previous history of the reservoir. Now the idea is that if you're able to match you know, the last five years, your model is going to be more predictive for the next ten years. Something like that. And this is essentially my new research. Um, that, uh, since I'm a geostatistician, or at least a statistician, um, I, I use Bayesian updating models, uh, methods. And um, the most famous one right now is what they call ensemble common filter. It's just a, a really fancy name uh, to look really smart. But the idea is simply that it's just a Bayesian updating. So if you remember a little bit of Statistics 1, probably, um, you basically write down a formulation, which in most of the cases is analytical, and it's based on Bayes' rule. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that, but in 2003, the Norwegians came up with this idea of the ensemble common filter. Um, most of the applications were successful. Um, there are a lot of oil companies using this, this tool here. Um, there are actually some softwares now that are, well, some service companies that are trying to implement this software um, in, their, in their packages. Um, I do that in MATLAB. But now, if you really want to know the research that I do, well, essentially, what I spend my day doing is something like this. Um, this, is, this is an example of Bayesian updating for a very simple problem. Um, generally, my talks are like about 50 slides like this, but 
I found out that generally people fall asleep, I think they really don't understand why. Okay, so this was an overview of the research that I do. Now, um, today I'm going to talk about something different. So we said there's a lot of uncertainty in our models, which means that there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in our predictions, obviously. If, if my input is, is, not cer is uncertain, my output is going to be uncertain too. So if Fred is the CEO of an oil company, well, he wouldn't be here listening to me, but if Fred is the CEO of an oil company, <laughs> Oh, yeah, free lunch, yeah. fine. Um, if he's the CEO of an oil company, he doesn't care about my probability distribution of um, total amount of oil in the hydrocarbon. He wants, he has to make a decision. The decision would be probably drill a new well or not. So he, wa he wants basically some numbers from me. Well, what I'm trying to provide here is basically a statistical tool to make that decision and theoretically at least make the optimal decision. Now, is it going to be the right one? Well, generally not, because there's uncertainty. But theoretically, it should be the, the, the best one. So th the main tool that we use is decision trees. And I didn't know what a decision tree was, at least from the statistical point of view, till last year. Well, this is how a decision tree will look li is, looks like. Uh, you have a decision to make, and there's some uncertainty on the outcome. Okay? Well, the real reason why I started to work on decision trees is that I really love trees. As a matter of fact, <laughs> and I don't care what they say in this country, this is the best mascot in the country right now. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see how we can use decision trees. So I have already told you essentially the idea is that uh, you build the model, you make predictions, these predictions are uncertain. So now, it, it's kind of, if, if this, well, this is the BHP, so this is not really uh, an interesting indicator for the CEO. But if you assume that this is the total oil production, obviously the decision if this is the true model could be not to drill, well, should be at least not to drill. And if this is the, the, the actual production, the, the predicted production, maybe the decision is to drill. Just, just an example. If my prediction is 50,000 barrels per day, well, he's probably going to drill it a, a well. Now, if I'm wrong, then probably I would be fired, but it doesn't matter. Um, if the, my prediction is 10 barrels per day, so per, obviously you're not going to drill, right? Okay, so in order to make predictions, we're going to use these decision trees. Now, here I just try to summarize all the sources of, uncertainty, of uncertainties that I could think about. Um, First of all, the limited amount of measurements. Well, at the well location, you have all the measurements that you want. You can easily estimate the amount of hydrocarbon at the well. But far away from the well, generally, you have seismic data, and that's it. Sometimes you have electromagnetic data, but the resolution is even lower. Uh, the quality of the measured data is an issue, because we said before, there's noise, and uh, um, the resolution generally is very low, especially if you work with data sets uh, acquired in the 70s, just because oil companies don't give you um, new data sets, well, the, the quality of the data is not going to be um, ideal. Um, there are approximations in the physical models. Um, for example, um, you know, we all use uh, Eclipse or well, any reservoir simulator to make predictions. Uh, CMG or, well, I use MATLAB actually, but it doesn't matter. Um, well, if you look at the physics inside, there are obviously some approximations. Darcy's law is not exact for the problems that, that we deal with. And most of all, some of the, the physics is derived at the pore scale. And then if you look at my, the, the, well, I'm not going to go back because it was 15 slides ago. But um, if you think about my discretized grid, the one for the North Sea, well, the size of the cell is 50 meters by 50 meters, which is uh, way bigger than this room here. Um, and sometimes you even get 100 by 100. Um, you could try to, to, to ask the, the reservoir simulator to, to build a, a grid which is one meter by one meter. Well, you would get predictions probably in 10 years. Um, so maybe it's not the ideal choice. There's a trade-off, obviously. And finally, there's a, there's a source of uncertainty that we cannot really get rid of, which is the natural variability and heterogeneity. Um, when we say that the, the, the average porosity in the grid cell is 23%, uh, well, in, in that grid cell, there could be some variability, which means that uh, at the top of the cell, it is actually 18, and at the bottom is 27. Um, this is actually more related to the upscaling, but if you think about the core samples that you see in the lab, sometimes even those are heterogeneous. Like, there are different uh, minerals combined in, in different ways, or not homogeneously, at least. So in order to... Um, 
represent this uncertainty, we're going to use, we can use probability random fields, but it's really complicated to analytically work with probability random fields, um, unless they're Gaussian, obviously. Um, it, well, actually, even if they're Gaussian, it's, it's not completely trivial. Um, what we're going to do is to use a bunch of models that are somehow sampled from those probability distributions. And this is essentially what we do in geostatistics. We estimate probability distributions point-wise, and then we sample. The, the only issue is that when you sample, you cannot really do that independently, location by location, because you don't want to have porosity 40% here, porosity 0% here, and 35% here. There has to be some natural continuity that is something that you see in, in, in geology, at least. So the, the, the geostatistic, geostatistics is a tool to sample from probability distributions with a spatial correlation. So we include a spatial correlation model, which in most of the cases, at least in our applications, it is an assumption. Um, you cannot really estimate or make inference about this spatial statistics model. You have to make assumptions. For example, uh, the length of ge the geobodies, unless you have an outcrop, is something that you have to assume. Um, here there are some examples. Um, so this is a synthetic 2D reservoir, sand and shale, very easy. I created 100 realizations. Um, then I took the, the av well, the ensemble average is just a, a, a stupid statistical way to say that you can basically sum them up and divide by the total number of models. Now, we have to do that carefully. For example, this is a 2D, and I assume that I had one well here, one well here. So obviously the well just has uh, one cell because it's 2D. But I did that such, um, I created these simulations such that all of them, they actually have uh, sand at the well location. If, you ha if we have some data, we have to use this data to condition our simulations. Okay, so the idea now is that I want to use these results to solve a decision tree that looks like that. So first of all, let's see how, uh, well, what solving a decision tree means. So I prepared this kind of joke, game. Um, okay, this is how a decision tree looks like. Let's say that um, I'm, we're gonna play a, a game with cards, right? Let's say that we have 52 cards, and the player wins if, uh, what did I write? Um, if the player drops heart, okay? So essentially, this is pretty easy to understand because you have uh, the probability that you win is 25%. Right? There are 52 cards, there are 13 um, cards of heart, and then, which means that your probability is w uh, 13 divided by 52, which is 1 fourth, 0 0.25. Now, let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's say that you have to pay to play the game. If you can see that as the, the ticket that you pay to get into the casino or something like that. Well, I don't know if you pay, I have never been there. Um, so first of all, you want to make a decision. Do you want to invest some money to play the game or, or not, right? Well, let's say that if you're really confident that you're, let's say that you ignore statistics. Um, if you're really confident that you're, that you're gonna win, you don't care about paying you know, a small amount of money. Um, if you're really afraid that you're gonna lose your money, probably you're not gonna invest. Now, well, before um, making this decision, obviously you, have to know, you, you need to know how much you will win. Right? You're not going to play a game for $5 if you win only two, obviously. So let's say that the outcome is $20. So you draw a card from a deck of 52 cards. Uh, if it is hard, you're going to get $20. But then remember that you have to pay something. So the net profit is going to be 20 minus what you pay. Now the question is, what's the maximum amount of money that you want to pay to play that game? Right? One could say, well, $5 could be a decent amount of money, it turns out that it's going to be a bad decision. Um, <laughs> so let's make an example. Let's say that I, I'm okay um, paying eight dollars. Oh, you have to pay every time you play. So if you want to play 100 times, you have to pay uh, 100 uh, $800, essentially, no matter if you win or lose. Okay? So let's say that I, I pay $8. Now, the probability of making the correct call is obviously 25%. The probability of, of making the wrong call is 75%. Now, the, if you make the correct call, um, then you're going to win $20, but you paid eight, so the actual profit is t 12. Now, if you make the wrong call, you're going to waste $8, right? Remember that you always have the average decision, which is not invest, you're not going to make money, you're not going to lose money, right? Okay, so now I solved the decision tree, and it is actually way simpler than what you can think. Um, 
it, well, at, at least in this case, you take the probability that you win times the net profit plus the probability that you lose times the net profit in case you lose, which is going to be negative. Well, it gives you minus 3. So how do you interpret this minus 3? Well, minus 3 is what you lose on average if you play on the long term. It's kind of intuitive to understand because if, it means that if I play 100 times, theoretically, if, if there's nothing wrong with the game, um, I should win 25 times and lose 75 times, right? Um, which means that for 25 times, I'm going to make $12. But for 75 times, I'm going to lose $8. If you actually sum them up and you divide by 100, which is the number of times that you played, on average, you lose $3. It doesn't mean that every time you play, you lose $3. Actually, there's no way to lose exactly $3. But on, it only means that on the long term, on average, you're going to lose $3. Does it make sense? Okay. And you can think, if, if you think that, well, obviously, 4 is not a statistically um, representative sample, um, but not large enough. But if I play four times, let's say that the first time I win and the second, third, and fourth time I'm going to lose. So I'm going to make $12 the first time, and then I'm going to lose minus 8, minus 8, minus 8. So it's 12 minus 24, which is minus 12, divided, I, I want to compute the average of what I lose or, or make, and this is going to be minus 3. Minus 12 divided by 4 is minus 3. Now, well, obviously you don't want to, to waste. It doesn't mean that if you play once, you're going to lose. It, only, it tells you what is going to happen if you do that on the long term. This is what probability is about, repeated samples, at least. Now, let's say that, um, let's say that now I pay $2, and now on the long term, I'm going to make actually $3 on average. So $2 is a decent amount of money that um, you maybe want to pay for to play this game. Okay. Um, if you actually invest five, uh, the expected, this is, this is something that in statistics is called expected value. There's nothing really expected, it's just a mean actually, it's, a, it's kind of a misleading name. But it is that if you pay five dollars, uh, this is going to be exactly zero, which means that you're going to lose. Now, if you're really brave, you're going to play anyway, even if you have to invest five dollars. If on the long, uh, on the short term you win, then I, should, I would suggest you to stop, because otherwise on the long term you're going to lose the money again. Okay, so everything is, is kind of easy, right, with, with this game. Well, the only problem is that we made a, a really strong assumption in this case, and the assumption was that the information was perfect. We knew exactly how many cards we had, and we knew exactly um, the probability to, to, um, to win. But if you think about our applications, well, in most of the cases, the information is not perfect. If I measure seismic data to estimate porosity, seismic data is not certain. The porosity estimation is not going to be certain. So what I have to deal with is exactly the same problem, but with imperfect information. Well, you could think about this as, uh, let's say that uh, instead of using one deck, they use many decks, and then they randomly selected 52 cards. Now, you, 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 don't, you cannot... Um, estimate exactly the probability that you win because you don't know which cards they selected, right? Okay, so in, in our case, well, for, for example, in that case, something that I could try to do, well, I'm going to just try to look at the cards and try to figure out what my probability is by cheating or something like that. Another option is that you buy some additional information, and this is something that we always do in reservoir modeling. For example, um, there's a... The, you decide to, the, the seismic that you had is really low quality, so you want to acquire a new seismic data set. Now, is it really worth it? Like, do you really want to spend, I don't know, the cost of an acquisition? But um, let's say that, that I'm going to drill a new well, so I'm going to spend $2 million for a new well. Um, is it worth it? I mean, maybe my, my decision is going to be exactly the same because that well is not going to tell me anything more um, that, than I knew before. Right. Uh, the typical example is that if you if you actually decide to drill a new well, but you drill the new well in the wrong part of the reservoir, it's not going to tell you anything about the, the how confident uh, you should be in your predictions. Okay. So if I include this part, well, the decision tree becomes um, um, a little bit easier, a little bit more complicated. Now you still have the same decision: invest money or don't invest. But now you can also decide, well, I'm, I'm going to postpone this decision. I'm going to buy new information. Now, I look at the information that I get. Obviously, you cannot look at the information before buying it, generally. If you try to buy another well from another company, they're not going to show you the data before giving, giving them the money. 
Um, now, I take a look at the information after I paid you know, a decent amount of money, and now I still have to make my previous decision. Well, think that this is drill a well or don't drill. Now, I buy some new information, for example, a new seismic data set. I do all my interpretation, and now I still have to decide, do I want to drill or not? So essentially, you take this branch of the uh, decision tree, and you replicate, uh, you um, put it here again. Um, now, the, the, generally, the square is a decision, and uh, this, this circle is, represents some uncertainty, right? So now, the first decision is, is here. If I pick one of the, these two options, I'm, I'm done. That, I mean, I could be broke as well, but at least I don't have to make another decision in my life. <laughs> but then, um, the other option is that you buy information, and in that case, you have to make a second decision. Um, well, here I just try to summarize what, what the decision tree is. Um, essentially, the, there, are, there are several components, but we have seen those. There's a decision, there's the uncertainty. You have to figure out the outcome. So, for example, how much money you make if you drill a new well. Um, and you have to figure out the cost, because in most of the cases, the, um, the outcome is going to be, the, the, the net profit is going to be the amount in the outcome minus the cost that you had to, to face to get that outcome. Uh, in the previous example, you have to figure out what you're going to win, which is something that could be written you know, on, uh, somewhere in the casino. You have to figure out how much you're going to pay, and you also have to figure out the probabilities that you win. Um, by the way, if, you, if you're thinking about applying these kind of things in a casino, it's not going to work at all. I tried. Um, so these are all the elements of the decision tree. So now in the last... 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I'm going to show you an example. Now, um, if you try to do this on a real example, it, it gets really complicated pretty quickly. So what I did is to try to prepare a super simplified example. My reservoir is just 2D. Now, I already have two wells, one here and one here. But for whatever reason, that's not the ideal location for uh, um, the wells. Um, like, you can think about it as, uh, let's say that if you look at the, the reservoir um, in a 2D section, you can think about that as an anticline. So basically, uh, your, your best part of the reservoir is here, which should, which should be in the middle. So this is the, the view from the top, and this is a vertical section. Okay? Um, so the best part of the reservoir could be here for some geological reasons. Uh, but for whatever reasons, your, your wells were drilled in the wrong location. So, you're producing, but you're producing really slowly, and um, you would like to make money a little bit faster than that. Um, now, I, I, again, I had to simplify a lot of the problems. So it, when you get into continuous properties, the decision tree becomes really hard to solve. So what, what I had to do is to try to discretize everything. So all the decisions cannot deal with, deci th these decisions, at least in this example, do not deal with continuous properties. So, for example, I could say porosity is going to be either 30% or 40%. There is nothing in the middle. Okay? The only reason is that you, you still can do it, actually, if you want to use a continuous property. Um, you're going to need something more than a PowerPoint to show that to the CEO of the company. Uh, now, so the decision in this case is I can drill one well here. I can drill one well here. I cannot select the locations. I, I only have two choices, one here and one here. I can also decide to drill two wells if I want. Um, and then we're going to make our life a little bit more complicated. There's a well for sale. So there's a company who's trying to get, uh, that is trying to get rid of a well. Um, and you, want, you, you, you will have to make another decision if you want to buy this data before drilling your well. So it's kind of similar to the previous example, just uh, in, in, in our context. Um, obviously, I had to, the, there's going to be a slide with a lot of text. I'm going to go one, line by line. And the only reason is that to build that decision tree, we need a lot of information. So um, I'm, I'm going to try to clarify that. Let's say that the current production is 500 barrels per day. Well, obviously, it's not realistic, but it is a 2D example. Have you ever seen a 2D reservoir? No. Um, and now the current profit is $40,000 per day. Okay. So this is what you get if you're producing from this well and this well at the same time without any, any further um, decision. Now, there are obviously some, some limitations. Let's say that you can drill a well if you want, but you have to pay $10,000. Um, it's basically, it's kind of realistic if you divide by 10 power 3. This is more or less, these are more or less the costs probably that um, they face in an oil company. 
and you only have two locations to drill the well. Let's say that for whatever reason, you're not allowed to drill in this mid section. Um, it's just a simplification that I introduced to make the decision tree a little bit easier. Um, now, in the subsurface, in this reservoir, we have a really complicated geology, sand and shale, and uh, the, the well is going to give you, um, the, the well is defined successful if the well is drilled in the sand. You cannot actually produce in the shale, at least not in this simplified example. If I drill in sand, my well is successful. If I actually hit shale, it's not going to be successful, so I just wasted $10,000. Um, now, if I drill a well and I hit the sand, then I'm going to make $40,000 more. If I drill two wells and they both hit uh, sand, um, I'm going to make $60,000 more. Okay? So, it, it's not exactly the double. And the reason is that the two locations are pretty close, so you could think about that as one well is stealing the hydrocarbon from the other well, something like that. Um, and then here, there, the, essentially, I'm not going to go into the details um, because th that's essentially the maximum amount of geology that I can explain, but um, the idea is essentially that you have a lot of uncertainty in the subsurface. You have two different types of rocks, sand and shale, and you also have some different geometries. Um, apparently, I learned that there's something in geology called shale barriers. Uh, there's something called sand point bars and sand flats. But the idea is that these are just different shapes of the geobodies. Actually, I think I have an example of those uh, in the next slide. Yeah, this one here. This is what I called, uh, th this is essentially an ellipsoid. This is essentially um, a rectangle. This is how I simplified my geobodies. Again, I had to make some simplifications to, to simplify the problem. So anyway, there's a lot of uncertainty. Here you can see that, well, the shape is the same. Otherwise, it, it gets more and more complicated. You have some uncertainty about the proportions. It's more likely that you're going to get 30% of sand and 70 of shale. But there's also the chance that you get 40% of sand and 60 of shale. Anyway, you don't have to remember all this data. I'm just going to use all these different combinations to build a lot of models and to try to mimic this kind of uncertainty. So now, how does the, de the decision tree looks like, uh, look like? Well, this is about more or less about it. Um, you have a decision initially. You want to drill at location one. You want to drill at location two. You want to drill both locations. They have to be drilled at the same time because if it is a sequential decision, it's going to be way more complicated than that. Um, and it, you don't drill at all. Now, for each of these options, um, you can remember that you can hit sand or shale. Now, it can be a sand bar or a sand flat. And it can be 30% of sand or 40% of sand. So you have basically to, mimic, to represent all these uncertainties in the decision tree. So here I have sand bar and sand flat. For each of these two options, I have proportion 30% of 40%. For each of these two options, I can drill sand or drill shale. We do that for location one. We do that for location two. We do that for all the possible combinations for both locations. For Well, don't drill is the easy one. Um, if you're wondering how complicated it can be, this is the solved decision tree. <laughs> so if you, if you want to take a look at that, you can actually see that. I'm going to tell you what the, the idea of decision is in a minute. OK. Now. Remember what I told you about the perfect or, no, or imperfect information? Well, there's the well for sale. The problem is that I can buy the, well, the, the information at the well if I want, but I'm not sure if it's going to be perfect or not. In most of the cases, it's not going to be perfect. So if it is not perfect, what you have to do is to, make a br to create a new branch of the decision tree to mimic the uncertainty in that kind of information. This doesn't include the information at the well for sale, by the way. If you do that, it's about 36 pages, but I didn't want to kill three trees at the same time because you know that I love trees in general. <laughs> now, if you add some additional data, essentially you have another decision to make if you want to buy the data. Now, that well could have sand or shale. Obviously, if the other company wants to, to, send it well, to sell that well, probably it's going to be shale, but there could be other reasons that you don't know. So you don't know that a priori, so you have to, dis to, to mimic this uncertainty. The sand uh, basically um, has sand in it or, or shale, 
And then for each of these, you have to replicate your decision tree again. So it becomes really complicated. I'm going to solve only the first part, and, uh, and I'm going to tell you what the optimal decision is. Now, here is where geostatistics come in. In order to mimic that uncertainty, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bunch of models. I think I created 400 of, of these models. Um, in this case, I use something which is called multipoint geostatistics. It's something that was developed at Stanford between 1990 and 2000, well, now, essentially. Um, so I have to create different models with the different proportions, 30% or 40%, with different geological features, sand bar and sand flat, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, remember that the 30% option was most likely to happen, that was more likely to happen than the 40% option. So I created more models uh, for that, just because it's more likely to, um, to, to be observed. And now here, I mean, these are examples of models and so on and so forth. Remember that you have the well information. So here, what I did is I averaged all my models. I just wanted to prove that my information at the well is correct. My two wells, the one that I actually own, um, they both have uh, sand. And then now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to pick model by model and I'm going to count how many times at the prospect location I'm going to see sand and how many times I'm going to see shale. Well, obviously, on average, um, this is essentially, this is a discrete property, essentially. Sand is one, it's a binary property. It's, uh, sand is one and shale is, is zero. So I can just take the average, Look the number here. This is going to be something like 36% or something like that. That's going to be the probability that in my prospect location, I'm going to hit send according to the assumptions that I made um, in the last 10 slides. Now, um, I'm going to give you just an example how we did that. So let's just focus on one number one. Here, there are the four different geological assumptions. Now, if I have send bar 30%, the probability that I hit send is 28%. Send bar 40% is 46 kind of obvious, right? If the, if the proportion of sand is higher, then the, the probability of hitting sand at that prospect location is going to increase as well. Um, sand flat is 37%. Sand flat 40% uh, is for 51. Uh, for whatever reason that I'm not really sure about, um, this kind of geology gives you a higher probability. Um, it's just a matter of connectivity. But um, I did the same for well number two. And remember that I still have the decision about buying a new well or not. So um, what, since I was there, what I did was I estimated the uh, probability of hitting sand and shale also for that well for sale, right? If this one here gives me something like 99%, I could decide to buy that well, OK? Now, if I do that, now I, I can look at the information. Now I can actually measure it. So there's no more uncertainty here. So I have to redo the same exercise by including the new information. So when you do the conditioning in geostatistics, if you acquire new information, you have to start from scratch and redo the entire workflow. Anyway, here I just summarized the decision tree. Um, there are, these are all the informations. So um, the, you remember that we have to put the net profit in the decision tree. So th these are the informations that I need. Uh, if you drill a new well, this is going to be $10,000. If you drill the well in shale, then there's no profit at all, so you're going to lose $10,000. If you drill the well in sand, you're going to make $40,000 more. At least this is for one well. But then you spent $10,000 to drill the well, so this is going to be 40 minus 10 is going to be 30. Now, if you drill two wells, it's a little bit more complicated, but the idea is that you spend $20,000 to drill two wells. You don't have a discount if you drill two instead of one. Um, if, you, if they both hit uh, sand, actually, the profit is going to increase by 60. But you wasted 20 times by drilling the wells, so the net profit is 40. Uh, you don't have to be a statistician to understand that with this profit, it's not going to be like, it's not really likely that this is the best decision to make, actually. You probably don't even need a decision tree. Um, now, you have also the, the, all the possible combinations. What if well number one drills, uh, you, you drill number one in sand and number two in shale and vice versa. Um, we're not, we're not going to look at that um, for the simple reason that I can tell you um, now that that's not going to be a good idea. Anyway, so now I have to put numbers in my decision trees, and then I, I'm done. So here I put all the numbers that I just told you. I, the first branch of the decision tree is just one well. So now I have two options, drill sand or drill shale. This is going to be plus 30K. This is going to be minus 10K. What I have to figure out are the probabilities 
which are the probabilities that I showed you in the table before. So I'm just going to populate this decision tree, this decision tree. Um, thin bar and thin flat are actually equiprobable, so this is 50-50. Now, it's more likely that you get 30% of sand instead of 40%, so this is 70% and 30%. This is something that the geologist basically can tell you, something like that. Um, and now, using my geostatistical tools, I can tell you that uh, the probability of drilling sand is 28. This is what we read in the table before, and obviously the other one is 72 because it has to be 100%. The sum has to be 100%. Okay, so we do the entire math. I did, I, I did that for uh, all the possible options. It took me more or less two weeks, ex especially to put all the data in Excel. Um, but the idea is that um, this is the expected value if you drill at location one. It's 2.5. Uh, this is for location two, it's 1.7, it's close. Um, this is the expected value if you drew both locations. We knew that it was not a good decision because um, the, expect the, sorry, the, the, the net profit was $40,000, which is pretty close uh, to, the, to the number for just one well. And obviously, if you don't drill at all, the expected value is zero because you're not doing anything. Um, so in this case, the optimal decision, at least according to this decision tree and according to these assumptions, is to drill and drill only at, at location number one. Now here, there's also, there's somehow a, a, another decision. Is it really worth it to, to take the risk and, uh, and drill at location one just to make $2,000 more? Uh, this is a little bit more complicated to, to put into in, in a decision tree. Um, now I'm gonna skip the part where, where, drill, where I buy the, the, the additional information. I'm just gonna show you the example very quickly. Um, essentially here, uh, there's the, the well for sale, but I don't know if it is in sand or shale. So I have, first of all, to estimate the probability that that, that, that well is going to be in sand or shale, and then I have to decide if I want to buy or not. Um, well, uh, I, I think I never told you the cost for buying the, the well. Actually, I don't have one, uh, but I'm going to make it up right now. It's $5,000, something like that. Obviously, it cannot be more than 10000 otherwise you just drill. Right. Um, let's say that it is five thousand dollars, and again, you don't have to be statisticians to understand that it's obviously a it's a risky move because the expected value in your best um, decision was two thousand dollars. Now you're saying I'm going to buy five thousand dollars for an information which is not even perfect, and it's not even close. Really, well, it's not. Re it's really close to well number one, so it's really likely that the information is going to be the same. Right. Anyway, I did all the math here um, or statistics. And here, well, I just described, I mean, this PowerPoint is available if you want, so I just put some, some additional text in case you want to really go through that exercise. I wouldn't suggest that, but anyway, so I saw the decision tree. It turns out that the best decision is, drill, is still drill at location number one um, because the expected value, I think, if you buy the data, assuming that the cost of the new well is $5,000, to buy the new well is $5,000 was something like minus 3000 so it's something that you would never do. Anyway, this is the, essentially the optimal decision, drill at location one. Again, it's a, it's a really simplified example. Um, we basically deal with discrete properties. Actually, I, only, I was only looking at binary properties. I only had two options. Um, in the continuous case, it's, it's way more complicated, but you could do that. You just need some integrals, but you all took calculus one, right? Okay, so essentially the, the goal was to present a kind of statistical way to make a decision based on all the results that we get in reservoir modeling. And the, the, the main idea for me is that in most of the cases you, you produce 100 models, you give those 100 models uh, to the oil company, and what they do, they take the average, they make the decision based on the average. Well, most of the, of the models that we apply to, to make predictions are not even linear. So if you make the average of my porosity, it doesn't mean that you're going to get an average production um, for, for different kind of reasons that, um, that I'm not going to explain. Just to conclude my talk, um, I was thinking about that yesterday because I gave this talk for the first time in Dubai, and now I'm giving the talk for a second time in Laramie. And most, in most of the cases in statistics, we make assumptions about Gaussian distributions, like this is the most common distribution ever. Well, in most of the cases in nature, there's no Gaussian distribution at all. If you think about in terms of buildings, well, this is the tallest building in the world right now, the Burj Khalifa, which is in Dubai. This is the 
the thickness of a reservoir that my friend is working on. It's a giant reservoir in Mozambique. This is basically one fourth of, oh, sorry, one third of the entire height of the Burj Khalifa. This is probably the tallest building in the state of Wyoming. And this is the thickness of my reservoir, which was a 2D, so the thickness is by definition zero. But what I figured out yesterday night is that you have to put things in context. If you do that, it turns out that if you add the elevation, so you don't use relative information, well, the Burj Khalifa is more or less at the sea level, so the height is more or less the same. This is going to be minus 2,000 meters. Now, Laramie is going to jump up to 2,000 meters, and my reservoir is going to be exactly the same. Um, anyway, um, I just wanted to acknowledge the School of Energy Resources for inviting me today to give a talk. I also have to acknowledge Professor Jeff Kears at Stanford. He's actually the first one who tried to apply decision making, well, at least as, as far as I know, um, in, um, in modeling in nerve sciences, especially modeling of uncertainty in nerve sciences. And he just published a book. Uh, you can find a very similar example to the one that I presented. It's actually an aquifer model in Monterey, California, um, where the problem, that they have to drill a well still, but the reason is that they have to drill a well to clean the aquifer because of intrusion of salty water from the ocean. So it's a really good example. Um, I actually built my example based on, on, on his application. And uh, if you want to take a look at it, it is kind of interesting. And I think I'm done. Expressed per day. Um, so the, the 60,000, if you drill two wells, for example, um, th these are numbers that they made up. Um, I actually, I think I normalized some numbers from a Ria reservoir somewhere in, in Angola. Um, but uh, I don't remember the normalization constant in, the, in this case. But the idea is that if you drill two w one more well, you're going to increase your, your profit by $40,000 per day. And if you drill two wells, you're going to increase by $60,000 per day which I'm not really sure if it is realistic, but something like Oh, yeah, yeah, essentially, I soaked my decision tree assuming just one day. Uh, for, you, should, you have a time, basically, you have a variable, which is time that I didn't introduce. So there, there's a need to go to compute all the time. Yeah, Isn't it a better option to, for example, go ahead and drill the well, A, and if it fails, go ahead and... Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Um, I mean, you can do sequentially, but um, if you do sequentially, you basically have two decisions to make, right? You have, first of all, you, you have to decide if you want to drill or not. And then you decide to drill well number one. And then you look at the outcome of well number one, and you want to decide if you drill another well. So this thing here becomes about 50 pages. There, there's, a, there's a toolbox in Excel, which is free if you want to try and uh, uh, it becomes really complicated, and it's just hard to present. But yeah, obviously, you never drill two wells at the same time. It was kind of not realistic. Right? Um, it, it, it gets really hard to, to explain these kind of decision trees with realistic assumptions, essentially, unless you talk about cards. So is there an ideal, ideal situation then, Dart? I mean, in terms of the geology, where this would be most applicable? I mean, the giant sand body you wouldn't have oh. this worry. Right. Um, it, it really, I think it really depends how much you can quantify the geological information, and most of all, how many cases, uh, different cases you can you can draw. In the sense that, um, if the uncertainty is about porosity, uh, you have to you have somehow to turn your your porosity model into a discrete model, which could be high porosity, low porosity, and uh, high porosity, mid porosity, low porosity. Um, for fascias, for example, it is easy. Like, if you're talking about four different fascias versus two, well, that's something that you can easily put in, you know, you just add as many branches as you need. With a continuous property, it becomes really hard. Um, what people did in the past, but not in our field, is to use experimental design, which is essentially a way to um, 
classify different um, different features that are not discrete by definition. So, for example, typically they do. Um, th this is actually the, something that they do in uh, in fluid flow simulations. They do not want to. They don't want to drill. Uh, sorry, to run uh, 100 simulations because it's it's obviously it's going to take forever. Um, well, maybe not now, but say 1,000 simulations is going to take forever. So what they do is that they try to select some specific models. How you do that? Well, for example, you could rank all the models by average porosity or total oil in place, and then try to rank them, and you pick the, the best case scenario, the, the, the worst case scenario, and the mid scenario. Uh, but in, in most of the cases, unless th there is a, a version of decision trees with continuous properties, but that's way more complicated. Like I, I'm, I'm not even sure there's you know a toolbox to do that. Um, but experimental design combined with with this approach could be useful. Now, how applicable this is in a real case, um, I'm not really sure. Um, I have never seen an application, even the one in Monterey, California, the aquifer model. There are a lot of assumptions in. In, in that, um, I think it, that, that they had to, you know, they had salmon shale again, and the proportions was, was um, were discrete essentially, or, or the different combinations of proportions were um, was just a limited number of cases. Um, cheaper models to rank, and then you can oh, say the models for the, for the, you know, that's a possibility. Sort of, if you think of a streamlined models that are much faster, you can use that to brand your... Yeah, that, that, that's another option. Like, for example, here, what you could do is say that you have a certainty on, on the, um, instead of having, the, well, yeah, let, let's take the proportions. So you have 30% and 40%. Obviously, that's not realistic. You, you probably have, you know, something that goes um, according to a Gaussian distribution from with an interquartile range, say, between 20 and 40, something like that. So what you could do is do, uh, with step 1%, do all the possible cases, then you're going to see that, obviously, 1% is going to have a response close to 2%, um, and then you can try to group them. It's like, you know, facies classification, when you, you guys, geologists, give me 15 facies, and they have to go down to 3, because this is what Sazmi can see, more or less. Um, that was a good comparison, I guess. Um, when, when the, the response is kind of linear, it is kind of easy. Um, for permeability, for example, it could be tricky because obviously permeability is not even Cartesian. Like you, we gener you could use the log of, of permeability, for example. But so, so I, I have a question because in geology, sometimes uh, we've gone to sort of a Monte Carlo you know, map and we try to find some lifting. We lift in uh, solving the complex problem many times. And so we go and buy better computers. Sorry. Uh, so I was wondering. That's the computer in, shop. In, yeah, they in, have made the last deal. Of in, <laughs> in hydrogeology, there are, there is an alternative way to look at the problem. Instead of discretizing and sampling, you just map the probabilities and solve the stochastic, you know, for the sample oh, yeah. average. And what you see is the barrier for you know more traditional simulation methods. So that, that if you collapse whatever density function or, that you have locally, because you learn something. It is implicit in the formulation of the simulation. Well, I think that the main issue is that, uh, so the, the, the idea is essentially that you have a set of, instead of having 100 models of porosity, like, well, here just have two of them, but um, you get a probability distribution. Um, so in each cell, instead of having a deterministic value, you're going to have a Gaussian distribution, or mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have to be Gaussian, but Gaussian assumptions make your life easier because the solution of the problem is generally analytical. If you assume that it is an exponential one, the, the, the math is going to be kind of messy to, to solve. So you have to do it numerically. Um, what you could do is basically to solve stochastic differential equations. Um, I think that the main problem with stochastic differential equations is given by the boundary conditions. Like uh, it's going to be more related to you know the, the, the models, the well locations, and, and stuff like that, which is something that. I don't, I don't think know. that that is a technical problem. I mean, it, it makes... Well, uh, well, mathematically, it's not that simple. I know, but I mean, the, what we do now is we do what you said might not be correct. Is I have all this nonlinearity, but I average out everything at the end. Forget about the nonlinear problem, and we just take an average and then yeah. try to calculate some kind of 
uncertainty on the average. And so well, I think that, I mean, obviously, if you could run, you know, 1,000 simulations, that, that would be representative enough of the posterior distribution. Mm -hmm. Like, I have 100 models of porosity, I run, well, sorry, 1,000 models of porosity, I run 1,000 fluid flow simulations, I get 1,000 production curves at the well, I, I basically do I plot an histogram, and that's going to be my posterior probability. Um, I, I don't think that math is really easy if you want to solve a stochastic differential equation, but I mean, uh, uh, it's, 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 because a, of it's a mass balance, uh, which is the easy part, but then there's Darcy's flow. Um, and then you have to make it stochastic, and it's not even uh, an ODE, it's going to be a partial differential. There are, there are elliptic solutions in st on the stochastic uh, problem. An analytical ones. Okay. Yes. And so I asked the question because you mentioned something else. Is the, the fact that we have to have the greeting done means that there is another source of uncertainty. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the model I used to do upscaling. And, it, and you can lump it all and solve the stochastic problem. That certainly that would be more expensive, but you don't have to do it a hundred times. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and close for today. But thank sure. you again.